for most people, if you ask them the question, what is the relationship between safety or risk and the quality of an asset, they would very, very, very quickly establish what they believe to be a relationship. Some might say that uh, good assets have lower risks um, and good assets are more safe. And vice versa, they might say that bad assets or average assets have higher risks and offer very little safety. In today's and in this session, I want to explore uh, what I believe is a, is a myth. It's a, it's a misconception within the investment um, uh, process. I'll start off by making a statement. And I'd like you to think about this statement before I expand and explain uh, myself. The statement I would make is that risk and safety have nothing to do with the quality of an asset. I'll say that again. Risk and safety have very little to do or have very little um, to, to explain about the quality of an asset. I'll use examples. If I came up to you and I presented you with an opportunity, uh, let's use opportunities or examples that are relevant today. I said to you that there is a company. It's the number. It's the it's the, it's the top company in the in the United Kingdom in terms of publicly listed companies. It's number one in terms of market capitalization. Or if I were to pick a company in the United States, and I say it's the it's the number one in market capitalization, and I ask you the question, what were your thoughts about the company? In the US, I believe um, the company with highest market cap as of today is uh, Microsoft. And if I asked you, what do you think about Microsoft? Most people would say that Microsoft, as an investment, is less risky or has little risk compared to maybe a company that is ranked number 500 in the list of publicly traded stocks by market capitalization. They might suggest that a company that is rated number 500 carries more risk and is less safe than a company that is number one. Now you can understand why that might be the inference. I think that's very wrong. And the reason it's wrong is simply because if you were to go back and you um, listen, if you were to listen to the session we covered previously, I explained that there was a relationship between price and value and that price is what you pay, value is what you get. They have a relationship. Price always tends to move towards value, whether it moves up or whether it moves down, but it often never gets there. So you might have a company where the market price is at 100 pounds, but the value is 80 pounds. And that simply means that it's overpriced. If that company increases its value over time, then what you might find is that price stays fixed and value increases to meet price. On the other hand, if the company is overpriced and maybe too highly or richly priced, then what tends to happen is that price will come down to meet value. Let's flip it the other way around. We have a company that is, has a price in the market of 150 pounds, and we've estimated the value as 300 pounds. If the market over time recognizes the mispricing or the hidden value in the company, then the price will move up to meet the value. But it never, uh, it's not a guaranteed um, promise. There is no promise 
that value would move up to meet price or price would move up to meet value or value would move down to meet price or price would move down down to meet value so the key thing to remember from yesterday's session was that it's important to recognize that price is what you pay value is what you get you must also make allowances for a margin of safety or margin for error that was where we stopped in yesterday's session which is where we pick up from today i started today's session by saying that the quality of an asset has nothing or has very little to do with its risk or its safety using the same examples if you were to buy microsoft today at its current price and you pay the market price although you may have been buying what may be a good company a great company and although you might classify that as a good opportunity your investment which is what we are looking at would be risky and the reason is possibly you may have overpaid for microsoft so if you've um, bypassed the process of doing your valuation if you have not included a reasonable margin of safety, then it's possible that you are overpaying for Microsoft today. But here's another point. In one of the earlier sessions, I explained that one of the important responsibilities of an investor um, out of the two that I considered to be very fundamental was asset selection, and that simply meant setting your objectives, identifying your goals and your strategy, selecting the assets, constructing a portfolio, and then manage the, managing the portfolio. I put all of those activities under the umbrella of asset selection. And then I said the second, and possibly a very important responsibility, maybe not as important as the first, but equally as important, is simply to understand how to position that portfolio that you've constructed, how to position it in the market, and how to read and understand the market. And that process I called cycle positioning, and that simply meant that there were times where the psychology of the market was very, very optimistic. There was optimism, there was a lot of um, greed, there was fear of missing out, there was a lot of capital being a provided or available um, in today's day you know interest rates are very low they are the lowest we've ever had them that's not to suggest that interest rates automatically correlate with high cycle but if you go back to december 2019 before we had this healthcare epidemic interest rates were at the lowest they had ever been generally across most developed markets and that meant that um, it was easier to borrow money. And when it's easy to borrow money, people borrow. So you could borrow money from the banks and companies could borrow money from um, you know, the banks and they could, they could take out loans and they could issue bonds because they could easily repay the interest. The key thing to remember is this. With cycle positioning, I was trying to explain that when the market is optimistic, where there's greed, when there is, there is no fear, there is very, very little risk aversion. People are happy to take risks. Then it means that you are high in the cycle. On the other hand, when there is fear, when there is anxiety, when there is depression, um, people are despondent, when people are very risk conscious, when people are afraid of risk, when there is pessimism, when there is little capital being provided, the banks are not willing to loan because they are worried about defaults, then that is another time in the market where it's low. So you look at a cycle that goes on. At the top of the cycle is optimism. At the bottom of the cycle is pessimism and despondency. As a manager or, or as an investor, if you could understand and read the market and understand the psychology of the market or the psychology of the people in the market, it's easy to then position your portfolio in such a way that when it's this high, 
then you become quite defensive with your portfolio. You choose assets that are a little bit more secure, safe, and assets in companies that could withstand you know, a downturn. When we are low in the cycle, you could take more aggressive steps. You can position your portfolio to pick up all the bargains because people are selling all of what they have at bargain prices. And I was trying to explain that if you understood those two qualities or those two requirements of an, of, of an investor, then it was easy for you to select the right assets, manage them, but then uh, adjust your portfolio based on the psychology of the market. And therefore, it means that you do not give out too much of the gains you've made during the boom, and you do not lose or give away a lot of what you've gained during the bust. So you can choose to be um, a little bit more adaptable and you could adjust your portfolio accordingly. Now here is the point of all of that explanation. Choosing an asset that is a good company or building that is a, in a good location does not necessarily mean that it's safe. And the reason is this. We go back to December 2019. If you bought um, into a few companies that were stable, let me give you some examples. Um, and here's probably the best time to bring in the importance of timeline. R risk used to have a definition which meant um, the likelihood of loss, the likelihood that you would achieve an outcome that was different um, to what you intended. So where the expected outcome and the actual outcome were divergent, we call that a risk. Uh, that was a colloquial definition. However, risk has multiple sub-definitions. If your investment horizon is one year and you're buying an investment that is illiquid, we consider that risky. By illiquid, I mean you cannot simply sell immediately. Secondly, if you're buying an investment and you have a one-year time horizon, but you do not have the ability to read the market to understand whether the market is high in its cycle or low in its cycle, you're taking a risk. Now, to put it into context, if you invested in December 2019, and let's say you had bought um, the, in, an index, say the S&P 500 index or the FTSE 250 index, and you only had a six months time horizon. Maybe it was money you were using to pay your rent or money you were using for your college tuition or for maybe your child education, child's education, but you only had six months. By putting your money in an investment in December 2019, you were taking a big risk. Although perhaps you may have even bought something relatively safe. You know, if you bought Amazon, if you had bought Apple, if you had bought Microsoft, you may have said, these are great companies and they are here to stay. However, your time horizon would have automatically rendered your investment activity or operation risky and unsafe. And here's the point. You had December and you had only six months. What that meant was that Today, at the height of this health, public health epidemic, we have across most markets that companies, some companies have lost 70% of their market price or market value. Some have lost 80%. But on average, in the UK, the total loss is in the region of about 31%. In the, U in the United States, it's about 30%. So if you bought the index, the S&P 500, which is the United States um, composition of 500 of the top companies, then it means that the money you had, the capital you had, you've lost 30% of the value. And that simply means that if you go back to the definition I gave about what an investment operation is, you've already failed in the first test, which is preservation of capital. So we are now in the month 
just at the cusp of moving from the month of March to the month of April. Let's call it April because it will be April in about two or three days. You're already almost five months into the sixth month. You've had December, January, February, March, and we're beginning the fifth month, which is April. Now, it doesn't look like the markets will rebound within a month, as a matter of fact. The information and the news we're hearing from the public health case is that it might get worse. And that means the markets will react to the events. And it means the market might go down even further. What that might mean is that by the end of the sixth month, which is the end of your time horizon for investing, there's a possibility that the market may go down even further. If we assume that it goes down further by another 10% and the total downturn or the total loss is 40%, what that means is that you made a very risky investment, not because what you bought was good or bad, it was simply because of your timeline. So understanding that the quality of the asset has nothing to do with safety or has nothing to do with risk, if you understand that concept, then you start to recognize that in many cases, it's not just about buying good assets. It's all about buying things well. It's about buying, making investments intelligently. It's about choosing the right assets. So I'll say this, I'll give you another example of risk. Let's assume that you have a longer time horizon. Maybe you have two years but you're responsible for managing money for other people. And you have made a promise. And let's assume the arrangement you have with your investors or your partners is that you would return a guaranteed return or rate of return every year and you will report back every six months. If that rate of return that is guaranteed was say 4%, and you had gone for a strategy where your partners give you money, you promise to return the money, but you also promise to give them 4% of your return every year. And your strategy was, I can invest this in the stock market and I can make 7% and I can pay them 4% and I can keep 3%. If the arrangement you had with your investors was such that they could liquidate their position anytime within a six months period, then it means that as of today, your portfolio is 30% down from where it was as of January, 2020. And you've already made contractual commitments to your partners to pay them 4%. If the market continues to go down by the end of the year, you might find that you owe more than you had. That operation would have been considered risky. So the point is, good investments are not necessarily linked or associated with safety and bad investments or average investment are not always and should not always be associated with risk. Now, let me play another scenario. Um, as of today, if you were to go and select one of the companies like the airline stocks or the hotel stocks or you know real estate stocks, or maybe even if you decided to go for um, something like the oil stocks, what you're looking at here now is industries or sectors, oil, uh, you can look at uh, airlines or you can look at any other sector that has been hugely affected, you know, hotels and, 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 and leisure, or you might even decide to go for the cruise, the cruise um, the sector. Each of these areas have been badly affected by this health, public health crisis we have. I'm going to, going to use an example. The cruise line has been the most affected amongst the four that I mentioned. The way the cruise line works is that they have ships uh, and they sail around the world. However, most 
governments have instructed all their citizens not to go on board any cruise ship because they are breeding grounds for this virus. And therefore, the risk of loss of life is much higher. Now, what that means is that the cruise line industry is unlike the hotels, where because the hotels are based in one location, they can use the properties for other uses or functions. You know, you can use a hotel um, in the short term for just your, use your meeting rooms. You can use it, you can hire out the halls, or you can use the rooms as hotel rooms, or you can even use as long-term apartments. However, if this epidemic um, passes away, people will go back to living their lives, and that means they'll go back to commerce and traveling and leisure and, and, and enjoying themselves. And that, that means that the hotel industry will recover much faster. Unfortunately, the cruise lines that have very high commitments in terms of financial commitments, we'll see a period where people do not return back to taking cruises as quickly as they would just visiting a hotel. Therefore, if you were to look at the cruise line industry and you said, well, the price of this company, which is a good company, you might choose the best company in that industry, the price of the company has fallen to, by 70%. And therefore, it's now an attractive opportunity because I'm buying it at a price which seems to be below what its intrinsic value would have been before the crisis. If you made the decision based simply on price, it's fallen down by 70%, it must be a good deal. That would be a risky investment and it would be an unsafe investment, although you may have been buying what would have been considered a good company six months ago. And this same company over the last 15 years may have been formidable and may have achieved really, really attractive results and performance. However, as of today, it could be a risky investment. Why? Because it still has and still retains the likelihood that it will go bankrupt. Why? Because, um, I'll put it to you in an interesting way, capitalism, um, would work even if you shut down the entire economy for 30 days. You could even stretch that to 40 days. Capitalism does not work when you shut down the entire economy for six months. Translate that to this sector. It means that this company can afford to go without revenues for three months, four months, five months, six months, because they have some cash. But if this is prolonged, if this epidemic prolongs, the company may not be able to meet its financial commitments after 12 months, which would mean that depending on the capital structure, the bondholders, the creditors will foreclose on the company. They'll liquidate the company. And that means, uh, let me explain to you in a very interesting way, because I, I realized I, I just, uh, it just came to my mind that I have not explained capital structure but forgive me, I'm going to deviate very quickly and explain what a capital structure means. Think about a plane. If you're flying from one location to the other, if you're flying from London to New York, the plane you fly with will have passengers. Um, the passengers will fall under different classes. You might be a first-class passenger, you might be an executive passenger, or you might be a um, coach, meaning the rest, the rest of the people flying. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Whenever you're flying and you're about to board, uh, the first thing that happens is that they board first-class or the executive um, passengers first because they pay much more or they are considered um, to be in a different uh, uh, management group. They allow them to go on board and they sit down first and then once everyone in the first class has boarded, then they board the rest of the plane. Think about that plane flying. When you land, usually the first class are the ones who get out first. And then the executive, 
and then the coach. I'm going to put something slightly, I'll put a twist to that story and say, just imagine the plane is flying. Because you have a hierarchy in the plane in terms of people who are considered, uh, I'm not saying this is right, but people who are considered possibly financially more important, um, they will come first. So if the plane was going to crash and the plane was going to go down, the first people who will get out would be the people in first class. They are allowed to jump off with their parachutes. The second group would be the people in the middle and then the coach. So the, they follow a pattern to let people out. In the same way, in a company, you have what's called a capital structure. To understand what a capital structure means, you have to understand what's called the basic accounting equation. The basic accounting equation um, says simply that assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. That sequence is very important. The accounting equation is not assets equals equity plus liabilities. No, because when you put it that way, you've reversed the position. It's important to understand assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Liabilities are creditors' claims on the business. Owner's equity are equity stakes in the business. We'll use your house as an example. If you have a mortgage, and you go and borrow money and you buy a house that is worth 200,000 pounds. That's what the house was, was bought for. If you only put down 10% of your money to buy the house, the bank gave you 190,000 pounds and you added your 10%. Now, if you were to place that in the basic accounting equation, you would say 200,000 pounds equals 190,000 pounds plus 10,000 pounds. That simply means that the bank owns your house. It's the bank's asset. Why? Because they have the claim on the house. You bought the house, it's in your name, but you're allowed to keep the house so long as you pay the bank every month whatever they've agreed with you to pay. Whenever you cannot make that payment, the bank will foreclose on the house. It will take back the house from you. In the same way, in a capital structure, the people who loan money to the company, banks or bondholders, come first. The equity investors, the people who buy fractional ownerships in the business, come second. So it's important to understand, we'll go back to the example of the cruise line companies. You're buying the company at a price that is below what it used to sell for because it's gone down by 70%, you're, excuse me, you're assuming because it's gone down 70%, you're buying at a good price. But if you do not understand how to read a financial statement, and that's the reason why in the previous sessions, I said that you needed some, to be an active investor, there were a few things you needed. You needed the skill set, the mindset, and more, more than anything, you needed the time to be an active investor. With skill set, I said you needed to understand accounting, finance, valuation. You needed to understand security analysis. You, you need to be able to read a financial statement and understand a balance sheet and recognize what each number means. Accounting is the language of business. So if you bought the company because it has a discounted price or a reduced price of 70% from its high, even if you were to have paid and allow for another 10% of a margin for error, you would still be making a very risky investment. And the reason is simply because the capital structure will decide whether you have any stake in the company. So if that this company cannot make its uh, contractual commitment or payment, the creditors will take the company into bankruptcy and they will take over the company. That process means that all the entire equity shareholders, everyone who's bought stocks in the company will be wiped out. So the key thing to remember is as you look at this credit 
this crisis we're in, be careful about the companies you choose. The key thing to understand is this. The quality of an asset does not always tell you how much risk it entails or it has or how much safety it has. You have to do the analysis. There are sometimes you would find companies that are maybe considered risky, but they are safe because the price has fallen to a level. Using the same example I was using, you buy a cruise line company, the price has fallen by 70%. You buy it. But because you're not financially astute and you don't understand security analysis, you can't see that it's a value trap and that the creditors are about to foreclose on that company, take it to bankruptcy, and therefore every dime, every penny you invested in the company will be lost because all of the equity investors will be wiped out. Why? Because the creditors come first. They have a claim on the company. On the other hand, you may have found a company that has gone down by 30%, but this company is an average company. It's gone down by 30%, but its capital structure, it has no debt. And that means it has no creditors. There is no one who has a claim on the company. So all of its net worth belongs to its equity shareholders. Therefore, although is only gone down by 30%. If you were to pay the 30% discounted price without a margin for error or a margin of safety, that investment operation would be much safer, or I should say could be much safer than the other alternative. So let me summarize by saying this. As an investor, safety, risk, has nothing to do with the quality of an asset. Understanding where you are in the market cycle, understanding the financial position, strength of the company, understanding whether the company has a necessity for access to financial markets, understanding um, the terms of the investment are very critical. And so always Try not to associate quality with good assets and risk with bad assets. Uh, we, go, we go back, if you were to go back, say, to the 19, say, 1999, you know, Yahoo at one point was selling at an astronomical price, you know, $100. And then there was the crisis and there was the crash. And Yahoo fell all the way down. And you could have bought Yahoo for $10, $11. If you... Paid for Yahoo, same company, but if you paid for it at the early stage of 98, going into 99,